Uh, first, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm not sure the world is that small, by the way. Uh, two, two, day, two nights in the plane in a row. <laughs> 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 uh, but, okay, it's not absolutely entirely true that I'm French. I have a US passport as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm hiding according to where I go between either a US passport or a French passport. So in any way, it, it's really fun to be here. It's always fun to, to be in Australia. Difficult to reach, but great to be. <laughs> so uh, the meeting was, the, the first sessions were extraordinary. Uh, and uh, hopefully the second session would be as well. So let me tell you a little bit first how come that I am in this place? I mean, everybody knows that I am a biased human immunology, 35 years of human immunology, or maybe not. Oh, yeah, more than this. Yeah, she says more than this. Damn. <laughs> and I started in 75. Well, the Jackson Laboratory makes mice and distributes mice all around the world. But for human immunologists, there was two reasons why I would join. First, uh, we now can make the mice we want, thanks to CRISPR te technology. Uh, we can put CD34 in mice. We have a bunch of mice with a bunch of cytokine, human cytokines. And we are now just altering the CD34. So when we're going to put the CD34 in this immunodeficient mice, we're going to have human diseases. So I think it's a fabulous day, a fabulous time. And the second is actually this institute, which is here, where we just got in. Uh, it's about 20,000 square meter. It's just dedicated to human uh, genetics and, and, and human disease. And uh, thanks to the state of Connecticut, which invested a lot of money there. This is the, the initial group. We're about uh, 15 uh, faculty at the moment. So it started about two years ago. I joined there a year ago. We just entered a month ago. And, and uh, we have uh, Gu, that is the director of the institute, a young man in the name of Charles Lee. Uh, and Ijuruan, those are uh, geneticists. We have a good group of immunologists already. But they are saying, oh, oh the immunologists are just uh, contaminating genetics, so we need to pay attention to these people. Uh, we have stem cells, we have microbiome, and we have computational biology, and we have cancer with LU, the CEO. So it's, a, it's an extremely interesting uh, combination that, that we are doing there. So that's, that's for what I'm doing here, and what I'm doing there, besides uh, trying to put human disease into mice, is uh, to do epigenetics. Uh, of course, it's a completely new thing for me. So to think about all these attack-seek and chip-seek and rich pet and chap uh, I cannot talk to you about it. I'm still in the process of learning. I'm probably a, an undergraduate student in this stage at this level. Uh, but it's fun. Uh, before going further, I'd like to, to dedicate that talk to Ralph Steinman, who discovered Android Excels 42 uh, years ago. And this is uh, the Ralph when uh, we were visiting uh, Kayo Inaba at Tsukiji in uh, Tokyo, this, this uh, market actually. And I came to Melbourne 20 years ago. Uh, I went to the market here. Because I think it's, it's when you look at the market that you see a country. And, and the fishes are very interesting, very different. The fruits are different, so it's always interesting. So here he had identified new dendritic cell types. <laughs> and, uh, and here, uh, Raf just had got uh, the Lasca Prize. And he was coming for getting his cytophoresis to get his dendritic cell vaccine. Uh, so, and we lost him three years ago, and we are very sad about it. We are missing him all the time. So he has had really a, an amazing career, and, and surprisingly focused on dendritic cells, but he has made so many moves in the study of dendritic cells, from this finding here in a the, in the mouse to uh, studying and injecting them in human being even, or demonstrating the concept of targeting, 
that we and you have been following up and we're going to hear about uh, has been an incredible career. Um, I was just reviewing the uh, 100 abstract. That's the advantage of, of flying to, uh, to here, is I could really read these 100 abstracts to select the three that are going to have a no award. And there was one where uh, Raf was there because he had provided all the, all the fusion protein, and it was, it was nice to see. Very exciting abstracts. It's going to be a great meeting in uh, Montreal in March about dendritic cells and macrophage reunited. So it's, it's going to be fun. So, and of course, Raf became very, very interested in the, in, in, the, in the last, I would say, 13, 14 years of his life into vaccines. And, and when you play with dendritic cells, you unfortunately are pushed, so to speak, away from dendritic cells because you want to see what they are doing and why they are doing it this way. And, and this is what uh, I will talk to you about. So uh, vaccines, you know, is a lot of prophylactic vaccines, uh, about uh, 70 of them. And, and they are there to prevent disease. And they mostly act through humoral immunity, but not only because for live battery microbes, you have really the, the cellular pathways that are turned on. Therapeutic vaccines are there to treat disease. Uh, there's maybe one that has been accepted by FDA, it's Provenge, uh, kind of a dendritic cell mixture. Uh, by the way, Dendrian just filed for bankruptcy recently. Uh, but it's the beginning. Uh, I think it's, it's gonna take off. <laughs> But obviously, this is based on cellular immunity. And, and we, many of us, have been trying to really establish a, a therapeutic vaccine there. Uh, and, but I believe we have, we have a, a future, but it's not easy. We have injected, Carolina and I, Carolina Paluca and I, we have injected about dendritic cells to about 100 and 30 patients with melanoma and 20 patients with HIV. Uh, we, we have seen some interesting cases like this one. A patient that had a melanoma here, in spite of a lot of treatment, as you see, the first dendritic cell vaccine that didn't do anything, and then a second dendritic cell vaccine made of GMCSF and IL-4 treated dendritic cells from monocytes and loaded with an allogenic melanoma cell line. This was a very dramatic finding. Actually, this trial out of 20 patients uh, has shown two remarkable clinical responses, and a third one, which uh, uh, came once the patient was discharged, and a uh, long time after, we felt that the patient had his lesion grow, and we considered that as a failure and a year later, it came back. There was no lesions anymore. It was just the fact that probably the cancer lesions were be becoming inflamed and grew and then disappeared. Others have found this kind of finding. Now, this has been a, uh, a difficult path. Uh, we've seen some patients respond, but many not respond. And of course, we need to understand why they respond and why don't they respond. And of course, one of the problems is we were attacking patients with stage four melanoma, which really immune system is extremely affected. But yet in these patients, for instance, we found that by doing peptide libraries and what we call the PMAX, we found that two clusters of, of, uh, uh, of this uh, antigen, which I think was marked in that case, two clusters would give us two different uh, specificities, peptide 6, peptide 13, and you see that before vaccination, that peptide here would not induce the proliferation of the T cells, but after vaccination, you would have a beautiful proliferation of the T cells. And then you would see with tetramers the presence after this eight vaccination of a lot of that specific CD8 T cells that two and a half years later would be here. Uh, that patient unfortunately progressed after five years, 
and the reason why the patient progress is something we have not very often seen in a dendritic cell trial is the loss of class one on the tumor. Okay. But what we were very interested in is these two T cells here, which are CDA T cells, actually were quite different according to the to the uh, their uh, gene, their transcriptor. I don't know which one was really keeping the, the patient at bay and keeping the tumor. Were the two cells important? So it really tells us that the clones that we are uh, studying are, or inducing are going to be very important and we need to really understand what's going on here. And certainly all this new novel technology coming up with the single cells, I think, is going to help us resolve a number of the difficulties we have had. So uh, what we can conclude is DC vaccine are safe. We have seen clinical responses, but we haven't seen really uh, much of a adverse events. Now, you could argue that this is because they don't do much. It's not entirely true, since we saw some clinical responses. And we have seen also a number of antigen-specific immunity. But as Ralph always used to tell us, you better get back to work. Okay, so we had to take the problem back from the beginning, and it brought us back to our early days when we had found with Christophe the making of human dendritic cells in vitro, a very serendipitous finding for us while we had been spending our life trying to recapitulate B cell immunopoiesis. We tested the GMCSF that we had cloned with Frank Lee. Uh, in 1984. And we tested it on CD34 cells, and when we added TNF, an unexpected finding was that the cells would grow much faster, while everybody would told us that TNF would be blocking hematopoiesis. And then we published, we had macrophages in 1990, and then three years later, we had figured out that those cells were not macrophages, but they were dendritic cells. And it took us a little while. But we quickly identified with Christoph that we had two dendritic cell subset in these cultures. One that was CD14 positive and corresponded to the dendritic cells that we found in the, in the dermis, which we now know are much more complex. There's at least three or four subsets there. And then one which was, uh, had beer-bag granules. Those cells had beer-bag granules, typical of, of human lung ground cells. And we have been really trying to understand why we had this subset and, and uh, proved with Christoph a long time ago that actually those two subsets were different. The red here of this one, they were making IL-10. They were inducing naturally IgM B cells to make plasma cells occluding IgM, but curiously not the memory B cells. So we had already the, f the, the concept that this subset would act differently on naive or memory B cells. And I'm going to come back to that for finding made 20 years later. Okay? And we had found that, that these cells were actually not as good as these cells in the T cell activation. So we came back with, with this and uh, with uh, <laughs> Ineweno and Enafkoshevsky, we studied the uh, dendritic cells that we were making either in vitro or we were isolating from human skin by pulsing them with peptide that would go to the HLA-201 and looking after nine days of culture as to the quality of the T cells we would have. In that case here, we are looking at CD8 T cells and we saw that the longer cells were doing a much better job at expanding the CD8 T cells than the interstitial DC, the CD14 DC. I know I think it's very different with mouse uh, longer and cells, but the mouse skin is very different from the human skin. And however, these T cells here were almost as efficient at killing a, a model system in the human called the T2, the famous T2 cell line, on which you pulse a peptide and then you put some T cells and, and the T cells kill. However, if you look at the real target, I was different. This was what the CD8 T cells would do. They would kill quite a difficult uh, melanoma cell line to kill. 
while these cells will not kill. And, and of course we wanted to know why is it? Would that explain why some of our vaccine would be efficient in the human and why they would not be efficient? Would that be an explanation for that? Besides the fact that the immune system of those patients might be altered. And uh, the answer was pretty simple. Uh, the Langerhans cells were inducing naive CD8 T cells to express a lot of granzyme B, a lot of perforin, a lot of, lang lot of uh, granzyme A, while the CD14 DC were inducing the granzyme B. But we're not inducing much perforin and we're not inducing much granzyme A. So there was a very dramatic difference in the priming of the CD8 T cells by those two dendritic cells. And actually, we could resolve after a lot of efforts, and, and thanks to also the monoclonal antibody that Gerard and Sonny Zwerski had made, we found that really the difference is that the Langerhans cells in the human make a lot of IL-15, while the uh, dermal DCs make IL-10 and IL-12. Now, what was extremely difficult is to really demonstrate that the IL-15 was the key element. Uh, we could demonstrate that if we were to add IL-15 to such a culture, we would get this pattern. But we wanted to demonstrate that if we were to block L15, we would have this pattern. And to get there, we had to have anti-L15 antibody and anti-L15 receptor. And we showed that actually the L15 was really at the immunological synapse between the dendritic cells and the T cells. And that's why it was extremely difficult to do. Now, hopefully soon, we'll be able to do the experiments where we're going to be CRISPRing IL-15 in CD34 HPC, and we're going to make dendritic cells that are going to have no IL-15. But this is what the evolution of, of technology permits us to do. We had to still say, is there something peculiar about the CD14 DC? Of course, we had, we had uh, found that a lot of good things about Langerhans cells. But this is where we did the experiment with the CD4 T cells and exposing CD4 T cells to the different DC subset. And then taking these activated CD4 T cells with the B cells, measuring in immunoglobulin what was going on. It was remarkable that the CD4 T cells exposed to dermal DC would induce naive B cells to make enormous amount of IgM, 300 microgram per male, and also induce a switch toward IgG and towards IgA. While the CD4 T cells prime <coughs> over CD1, prime over the Langerhans cells, would not do such a job. So that was really kind of the, on the one side we have more of the CD8, on the other side we had more of, of the, the B cell pathway. But really, as I had mentioned to you, that these cells were directly helping B cells to make IgM. So that brought us to the concept, which actually is being developed at the moment by my colleagues, my former colleagues, that uh, if we were to target Langerhans cells in the human, we would have more of a CTL response than a CD8 response. While if we were to target the uh, CD14 DC, we would have more of a B cell response. And I think this can be extremely useful in the context of HIV vaccine, that you need to target different antigens to different dendritic cells to get the kind of vaccine you want to have. Now, trying to understand what those T cells were, in year 2000, the TH1, TH2 concept that I've seen uh, being developed by Bob and team at DNEX in 1983, uh, has been developed with the TH17, the TRAG, and the TFH in 2000, where these cells are making IL-21, and uh, we felt that this CD14 priming we had was actually inducing those TFH cells, and it was actually the case, because TFH are characterized by this cytokine, but also CXCR13, and indeed, the cells that we generated with the CD14 DC were making CXCL13 and IL21. So we wondered whether actually uh, we would have those TFH in human blood because uh, everybody at this stage in the, in 
that was toward the 2008, people had described in the human, the, T, the, the TFH, as germinal center B T cells that would have the ICOS MCXCR5, that, that uh, small population here. So we looked in the blood with, with Hide Ueno and Rimpei Morita for the presence of CXCR5 positive CD4 T cells, and indeed, it was a beautiful population, mm -hmm. very sharp, mm -hmm. that could be isolated, which represent about 20% of memory CD4 cells. So we wondered, actually, how those cells would relate to the classical TH1, TH2 pathway from uh, Tim and Bob. And particularly uh, in the human, identified by the expression of CCR6 and CXCR3 by Federica Salusto and Antonio Lanzavecchia. So we isolated the CXCR5 positive cells, which we considered as the TFH, and further uh, analyzed them according to CCR6 and CXCR3. And what you can see here is that population which is called a TH1 population, can make interferon gamma and not much else, while the uh, double negative here was making IL-4 and IL-13 corresponding to TH2. And these green CCR6 positive cells were making essentially IL-17. And as you see here, this population of CCR5 positive cells make IL-21. And this population here make IL-21 as well. Now, these cells don't make much IL-21. Now, what happened in terms of helping B cells? As you can see, this population here, the CXCR3 positive population, doesn't help B cells much. Actually, it's even in a bit. While this population of TH2 cells help B cells a lot with making IgG, and switching to our IgE consistent with the presence of IL-4 and IL-13. And this population of cells making IL-17 was helping a lot of IgM production, IgG and IgA, including IgA1 and IgA2. So basically, it seems that we have a TFH17, a TFH2, and a TFH1. So we think that the the dichotomy, the, the, your TH1, TH2 can be either making IL-21 or not making IL-21. So now, how does that relate to the immune response to vaccine? And, and how can we <coughs> build on this information and this finding to improve the generation of vaccines? Obviously, uh, we have vaccines that work very well. But we have vaccines that don't work very well. Influenza is one of them. Well, influenza vaccine is still 36,000 deaths in a, in a regular year in the US. Influenza vaccine works relatively well in young adults, but it doesn't work uh, in elderly uh, being considered as above 55. Uh, the Hep B vaccine, the same, doesn't work well, and we would love to make a, a very good HIV broadly neutralizing antibody, but that's a different question. So the, the influenza represents a very interesting uh, way to study whether this cell population uh, makes any, uh, has any importance in this response to vaccine. So we designed uh, a number of years ago, as you see, uh, there was a season 2009, 2010, 2010, 2011, and 2011, 2012, with a total of 49 healthy adults and 20 healthy children, we looked at the uh, response of the TFH cells in, uh, to the influenza vaccine in these patients. What we saw is uh, if you look at individuals who received saline instead of any vaccine, and you look at the presence of CXCR5 in their blood T cells, CD4 T cells, you see that there is very few cells that express high cost, a marker of activation. Well, if you use the flu zone vaccine, the most common vaccine in the US, which doesn't have a specific adjuvant, this is what is made by Sanofi, you see that the CXCR5 positive cells start to express uh, high cost. Now, this is a very transient thing. 
This is only at day seven, which is very interesting. Is this is the same time as when the uh, plasma cells come in the blood and disappear. So, what are those cells? Well, complex analysis by using this uh, again this separation of the TFH cells according to the TH1 and the TH2 pathway permitted us and permitted the group with Ide Ueno and Salah Bentebibel to demonstrate that only one subset of the TFH was actually activated in vivo. And this is definitely not the one we expected. We expected either this one or this one because I have shown you that these ones are the ones that are activating the B cells. The one that came up is this cell population here that now has about a third of them expressing across. So it was surprising uh, because we had shown that the cells originally were not helping these cells. Well, the assays are different. Okay. And this is where the, the detail in the assay is extremely important. But what was very remarkable is that there was a perfect correlation between the increment of these cells, and this is 110 cells per microliter of blood. And if you increase your number of cells, you increase your viral neutralization titans, it be that in the children or the two different cohorts of adults, and you see the value here. And if you don't increase these cells in your blood, you don't increase your uh, hemagglutination assay or your viral neutralization theta. So perfect correlation there. <coughs> so what can we demonstrate? I mean, this is often where we are very limited in human studies, is that we have correlation, but do we have really the demonstration that the cells that you are talking about are doing the job? And this is where uh, Galinde uh, Obermother did sorting of four subsets of T cells, two subsets of B cells, the naive and the memory, put these various cells together. And in the assay that we used here with a super antigen, looked at B cell differentiation. And what is happening here? What is happening is none of this population of cells were activating the naive cells. Only this population of cells, this ICOS positive, CXCR3 positive, was activating the memory B cells and not the naive B cells. So this is really consistent, actually, with what we know out of the flu vaccine. We know that the flu vaccine actually activates memory B cells. And, and it demonstrates that this population of cells can activate memory cells but cannot activate naive cells. So again, that distinction that I alluded to earlier. Now, does it work in an antigen-specific response? Yes, it does. You see here, with the culture with the memory B cells and the flu vaccine itself, you see that this is only this population that permits the secretion of influenza-specific uh, antibodies in the culture. So to conclude on this, the uh, trivalent influenza vaccination induces high cost on the CXCR5 positive, CXCR3 positive, CD40 cells with a peak at D7. That this emergence of these cells might serve as an early biomarker for antibody response. And that this is essentially uh, associated to recall antibody response. Now, what we need to understand is how can we induce this cell population? And how, why are the people not responding to the vaccine? And this is what brings me into epigenetics. And I want to understand either at the level of downloading cells or at the level of the T cells, whether there is a problem here and how can we solve this issue. So I want to, 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 to end this, this, uh, my talk with, with a work that was uh, recently published to uh, pursue on trying to understand how these vaccines are working. And this is a work that 
uh, elaborates on what Virginia told you, and this is with Virginia and with Damien, on the uh, transcriptomes on the uh, peripheral blood of people who are vaccinated. You have uh, heard from her that how the modules can permit to simplify a, a classic uh, heat map. And uh, when we uh, looked at the uh, at patients uh, vaccinated with influenza, which is this green thing, uh, we see at day one a peak expression and then a second peak at day seven. And if you look at the peak at day one with influenza, you find three typical interferon signature here. By the way, you can look at this, the fact that this signature disappears to, be, to give rise to a plasma blast signature here. And that another vaccine called Pneumovax, which is made of polysaccharide, doesn't induce that interferon signature, but induces a signature that is associated to myeloid cells, though this vaccine can induce the plasma cell signature very highly too. So this is being studied in terms of TFH or Pneumovax, and that's a different question. But uh, Romain, uh, working with, with, uh, with Virginia, has <coughs> tried to understand how these different vaccines would affect this different dendritic cell subset. So he went through a lot of studies on activating dendritic cells and different kinds of dendritic cells with different kinds of activators to generate a uh, series of modules for those activated dendritic cells. And this, the conclusion I want to bring here is that uh, the uh, signatures with three vaccines that he has studied, Fluzone, Pneumovax, and Gardasil, which is the HPV, are different uh, according to the cell type. And it was a kind of a surprise to me to be so different. Here we have uh, selected a number of modules, which are inflammation and interferon, basically. And what you can see is, for instance, flu zone can induce, this is four different individuals, OK? It's re relatively uh, stable, the signature you see. Those are monocytes. Those are L4DC from the same monocytes. Those are BDCA1, CD1. CDCs, those are CD141 DCs. And you can see that the difference, flu zone activates differently those different APCs. But what is even more dramatic is that Pneumovax is activating even in a more different fashion. You see the activation of monocytes is basically the reverse of what you have with flu zone here. That the L4DC are not responding to Pneumovax, at least for that selected set of, of modules, of course, with a bunch of modules that are going to be common there. And that the Gardasil is remarkable in its way to activate the CD1 CDC while it doesn't touch the L4DC or the monocytes for these sets of selected modules. So that is extremely important. Uh, of course, now we need to try to understand in a better way how this relates to the clinical response to the vaccine. And with flu zone, basically, this is an interferon signature that is prominent, while with Novavax, it's an IL-1 signature that is prominent. And uh, the uh, virus vaccines do activate in a, di in a different fashion the different DCs. For instance, here, if we look at the CD1 CDC, you see that uh, the different vaccines can give you a very different profile on the activation with CD40, CD80, CD3, CD86. So it's not just genes, transcription, it's also surface molecules that are different. And that might explain why we have different paths that are activated with those vaccines. So obviously, to conclude there, different vaccines induce different transcriptional profile in vivo that different vaccine activate one APC type differently, that different APC respond differently to one vaccine, and that uh, we have now 150 years of empirical, empirical vaccine development. How are we going to put that into a coherent framework will require absolutely gigantic effort. And I really hope 
that this novel humanized mice, this highly efficient humanized mice, are going to help us understand how the current vaccine works. And for me, this is going to be by this knowledge that we probably will be able to design better vaccine as needed, for instance, for HIV. The people who did the work, uh, there is uh, a very fundamental role of Ile Ueno in, in the subset of dendritic cells and with NAV. There is a work of Carolina with the DC subset and, and she has been leading the HIPSA program now in, char in the able hands of Virginia. Uh, Damien has had a very critical role. Uh, Damien who is now in Qatar at SIDRA has had a critical role in all the uh, bioinformatics and uh, Roma has done the work with the WXL subset. Lots of collaborators, collaborators of Ide Weno, particularly Nathalie Schmidt, Salah and Rinpei, collaborators of Damien, Charles Queens and Derek Blankenship in the vaccines of Davio Ramilo, as well as Adolfo Garcia Sestri have been very important. So this is the work of the past for me and uh, hopefully I hope it's not going to take me 20 years to come back here. Uh, but uh, that's uh, been very exciting and it's very exciting to be here. And thank you very much for your attention.